Tommy Reynolds has his gun out. He's pointing the gun. And all of a sudden, I see this woman. They say it's on every single station. They're saying that daddy died. He said there was an accident and um, your father is, is no longer with us. In real life, I'm not like that. And the Mario test was disgusting. One night I jumped out of a car and threw me 60 miles an hour because I was addicted. Salute, mob tube. Salute, mob tube. How's everybody doing tonight? I know I just saw you guys about an hour and a half ago, but as I told you earlier, I'd be back with the Sorellis. They have some very interesting stories to tell us. I'm looking forward to this because I was always kind of intrigued by the story of the Amityville Horror and the DeFeo family. And they're going to talk about their family's connection to that and tell us a little bit about the, the mob connection. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. They did send me some articles and stuff, but they said it wasn't, uh, they didn't feel it was necessary for me to put up. So they're just going to tell their story. And, oh, Junior, look at you. Thank you for starting off with a super chat. Things are uh, slow lately, so I appreciate that. Junior, 999, did anyone catch Tony and his friend eating? Somehow Tony's friend is worse than him. The lip smacking, gum bumping was something. What a treat that was. Yeah, I'm, no, uh, I'm not surprised uh, to hear that about Tony Pizza's friend. <laughs> Thank you very much, Junior. I appreciate that. Um, so one other thing I want to ask you guys, first of all, please, please, please hit the like button. And secondly, I am 15 subscribers away from 4,000, 15 subscribers. So if any of you watching now aren't subscribed, please do that. Maybe I can hit 4,000 during this show and I will keep asking that from time to time as we go on. So let me bring on Jimmy and Marie Sorelli. What's up, guys? How you Hi, doing? Everybody. Tip of the cap. <laughs> I'm glad to have you guys everybody. on. Yes, I'm glad to have you guys on tonight. Thank you for joining me. Glad to be um, here. So you want to tell us a little bit about what you, what you want to talk about tonight, and then you can get started into your story? Go ahead, Jimmy. You start. Yeah. Well, let me start uh, by doing this, Jimmy, and not to cut you off, but mm -hmm. for anybody who doesn't know, there's not many people in here, but for anybody who doesn't know, who the Sorellis are, uh, Jimmy and Marie's great aunt and uncle were Mikey and Nettie Sorelli. Mikey was a wise guy with the Gambino family, and his wife, Nettie, their great aunt, was the lady that lived in the Ravenite, or I'm sorry, above the Ravenite social club when those bugs were placed and John Gotti was caught on tape um, discussing some things that would later get him convicted. So that's who the Sorellis are. They have a lot of uh, family ties to the mob. And uh, now I'll let them uh, tell us about what they want to talk about tonight. Go ahead, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah, as we were talking, uh, Chris, and I was talking about this with Marie about a week or two ago, I forgot. I mean, not that I forgot. The Amityville Horror murders, when we were living in Lindenhurst, uh, I think two days after the murders were committed, my father got a phone call to go to the house. It was only 10 minutes from where we lived. Because it went right. Amityville, Colpeg, then Lindenhurst. Right. My father went there. Couldn't get nowhere near the house. The only thing the police told him was that they think it was somebody in the family and that they were still investigating. Years later, when I was living with my father, I think uh, it was a news a uh, show ab about Ron DeFeo, and my father was disgusted, and he was talking about it, and I says, you know, what happened? Because remember the night I, I got called and I had to go to the house? I'm like, yeah. He said he had an argument with, with the father. He was on drugs, probably LSD, because that was big back then. And he, was a, he was a drug addict, he was a car thief, and he was breaking into houses in Brooklyn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were advised to get him out of Brooklyn, and they moved to Amityville, which was a very, very rich area. That part of Amityville. The yeah. house was gorgeous. Yeah. So when he came home, the father was very abusive. They were struggling. 
The father went in the closet, got the shotgun, and the mother was trying to get in between. Shotgun went off, and he killed the father and the mother. The sister, the one sister was in the hallway, and he and he shot her. Now, the, the younger sister was sleeping in, in the bedroom, and he killed her. Mm-hmm. Now, my father told me that he went, took whatever money the father had on him, any gold, whatever, got in his car, took his car, and, and went to Brooklyn. Now, I think there was one of his friends with him, and he went on the lam. And they found him, I don't know, maybe a couple days later or whatever. And that's how it happened. Now, with these flies by the window and all this other stuff, that's Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood. You know, the, he was a known troublemaker. He didn't get along with his with his father. Well, his and, father was a was a brute. His father used to terrorize that family. He had bouts of of anger, and he would mm-hmm. take it out on everybody. And Ron Jr. was the was the brunt of a lot of his anger. I mean, he was really a really a bad a bad father. They used so to Ron Jr. Out. was a ticking time bomb, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. it had gotten to the point that the parents couldn't control him anymore. So they just started buying him boats and cars and trusting him with $20,000 to make a deposit in the bank. And it's like, you know, it's either you give in to the kids or you throw them out. And I guess to them, buying him a boat and giving him money was better than, than having him act the way he was. I mean, I don't I don't understand any of that, but that's what they did. And, and, and back know, then, so, I'm sorry, Mary, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, and back then... The drug of choice at in that age group was yeah. LSD, hash, of course, marijuana. Cocaine wasn't heroin. even in the mix. Yeah. Though heroin. it was the and yeah, heroin too. But it was big with it was big with guys his age, especially where he came from and when he moved out to Long Island. He didn't want to live, he he did not want to be in Long Island, from what I was told. He hated right. it. Yeah, hated he moved in. 1965. So he was what uh, nine years younger than I think he was in his early 20s when he committed the murder. So he was a he was a young teenager, and that's hard. I mean, you know, as a teenager, you don't want to move and leave your friends, especially when you live in Brooklyn and then you go to the island. It's like you know, it's like bumfucked Egypt, you know, especially back yeah. then. Yeah, you know, there was there's nothing. There was nothing there. Uh, they lived um, on a dock. They had a you know a lake or a river behind them and. Again, when you come from Brooklyn, that's not impressive. You know, you want to hang out with your friends on the street. And yeah, they were right off the uh, they were right off the Great South Bay. Yep. I used yep. to go fishing there when I was a kid. You know, as a matter of fact, they named the house High Hopes because when they left Brooklyn to move to Long Island, the father was actually doing good in the car business. And oh. um, yeah, that's right. The fair, the fair autos. That's right. Yes, in Brooklyn, we, and, we um, bought a, Daddy bought a car from them. Yes. Yes. And when they moved to the island, it was it was a big deal to move to the island. I mean, even when we were kids, moving to Long Island was like, oh, my God, we made it. It's like, you know, the Jeffersons, yeah. you know, we're moving on up, yeah. you know. But he didn't he didn't want to he didn't want to leave Brooklyn. He didn't want to leave no. Brooklyn. Kid. He had he was making a lot of money from what I understand, robbing cars, bringing in the chop shops yep. and breaking in the houses. Yep. And, and the Genovese family, wise guys out there told told the Uncle Pete. And the father, mm-hmm. get him out of here. Yeah. Because he's going to get yeah. caught robbing the wrong house, robbing the wrong car, and we're going to kill him. So they yeah. did him the favor. And he was rebellious. And he even said it on one of his interviews. He said he was he was heavy into LSD and other mind altering drugs. And he wasn't in the right state of mind. He remembers arguing with the father. And the shotgun went off. Remembers killing the father and shooting mm-hmm. the mother. He doesn't yes. remember shooting the... The system in the hallway and the system in the bed. He's blaming he's blaming his friend. Yeah. He said that there was a friend with him and he was mm-hmm. the one who killed the, the other two sisters. That's well, what he said on one stories. of his Yeah. But I, I no, they would have found out by by now or back then. There he might there might have been a friend sad. waiting outside because the Long Island Railroad, I think he took the train there. Yeah. Like the house was not far from the railroad. Yeah. And when he took his father's uh, money and gold, he took the car keys, and then he bolted the book. 
Yep. Yep. Gotcha. And as a matter of fact, it happened this month, November 13th. What, uh, almost 40 years ago? 50 years 19, ago? I got the article here. It was uh, 1974. 1974. Yep. November 13th, 1974. I mean, he went, his his attorney went on to say he was possessed by the devil. Um, then it was the sister did it, and he took the gun away from the sister and killed the sister in the hallway because he was trying to protect himself. Then it was the mob. That's how the mob got involved in this. Thank and you for bringing that up, because here's the article here, and we're going to talk about Pete in a second. It mm -hmm. says that Pete DeFeo, who was the, the great uncle, okay, right. ordered the family killed because he feared that they were going to talk right. about his brother, Rocco DeFeo to law enforcement, which right. that is a bunch of bunk <laughs> because that man was never under indictment. I never heard of that man being, uh, you know, wanted by the FBI for anything. And we'll get we into him in a second. don't hear much about the Genovese family either. I mean, for some reason, they they tend to stay under the radar. But it, and they're it the never, family. You never, it was never like mentioned. All you heard about was the killings and then these this family that bought the house. And then Hollywood stepped history. in. They did the book and the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. Well, what the Lutz is, the people that bought the house after the DeFeos claim is that um, they actually bought all the furniture that was in the house, including the beds that the kids were killed in and so on. And they paid $400 for all the furnishings in the house. And supposedly... The furniture was haunted, and chairs were moving in the on the floor, and the walls were bleeding blood, and in the sewing room is where the most possession of the of the devil was, and there was flies on the windowsill, and I was like, "What the hell, man? Where do you people get this from?" I mean, I can remember watching the movie and saying to myself, "Oh my god, we knew." You know, these I never. How the hell do we know these people? I never, I never seen the movie. Ugh. I never read the book. Yeah, nothing. I've, I've been to the house months. with my friends when I was living out there. Scary well, looking they changed, house. They changed the address. Yeah, it's no yeah. more 112 Ocean Avenue, I think. It's something else now. It's like 125 because the house became a tourist attraction. Yeah. When Halloween they, came they around, it was huge. The windows. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, so the two side windows. Yeah, it's funny. Um, when you look up, um, that, that house now on Google Earth, when you look up that address, they have that house blocked on Google Earth. I don't know how they do yeah. it, but it's blurred out. You can't even yeah. see it. It's crazy yeah. the way I didn't even know you could get something like that done. But I guess because so many people want to, you know, take a look at the house. Oh, it was, uh, it was big. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was big back yeah. in the late 70s and 80s with Halloween. Everybody would go there, want to take a picture or just go in front of it. I mean, you know, I remember the police uh, was blocking the block off, preventing people from going down there. Yeah. Say, uh, yeah. psychics wanted to have seances in the house, and reporters wanted to sleep there to see if uh, the walls were bleeding. And uh, they, they, they claimed there was a room underneath the stairway that was a secret hidden room. And there was never any of this stuff. So um, I don't, you it was, know. It was, oh, please, please. It was all a bunch of bunk. They they did so many 2020 uh, things with uh, those investigative reporters and, and other cable shows uh, about it being demonic and this and that. I mean, come on. Come on. You and know? as a matter of fact, Ron DeFeo just died in prison. Yeah, in, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know that. This year. Yeah. Oh, he did? I don't know how he died. I think it was natural causes. Yeah, he died in March. And he was young. He was 64, year. 69 years old, yeah. something like that? Yeah, he was, yeah, I think he was 69. 69. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he still never really owned up to what he did. I mean, he turned around and said if he had the opportunity to do it again, he would. Because he hated his family so much, you know, but. Yeah, I seen know. one of his interviews. I mean, at first they put him in South Oaks. Yes. And I forget where they put him after that. Then he won. They did put him in prison. Right. All the way upstate. Yeah. And I know he was fighting that. Because he said he couldn't remember what happened that night. And right. then late, years later, he was remembering bits and pieces. And he kept changing his story. He had 12 stories to Sunday. Every time they asked him of what happened, he came up with 12 different stories. And then it, it got to the point where I think one one um, 
person who wrote an article about him was actually um, a, a med tech in the prison giving out medication. And um, DeFeo was on OxyContin in prison. And when he would get the buzz from the pills, that's when he would open up and talk. And he started talking to this med tech about what really, supposedly what really happened. And he said there was he was never possessed. He was high as a kite. He killed his parents and his family because he couldn't stand them. Uh, his, his brothers and sisters were treated better than he was. And if he had the chance, he would do it all again. Oh, did exactly he have a brother? Same way. He had a brother? Yeah, he had, had two brothers and two sisters. Well, they, they weren't there. Total. They weren't there in the house, though. Four kids. Yes, there were. There was four kids. There's seven total in the family. Six were killed. Ron DeFeo was number seven. Ron is Jr.'s the oldest. It's two sisters, two brothers, and the mother and father. Six people were killed. So that two night he killed, he killed he killed the parents killed and his two sisters. Old, a nine-year-old, a 13 and a 15-year-old, yeah, and his parents. And he was the oldest. You guys yeah. really got this story down. So here's a question for you. <clears throat> Back then, obviously, you know, uh, I wasn't around yet. Um, the None of that talk of, you know, Ron DeFeo Jr. or his father or anything being possessed or any of that horse shit. None of that was spoken about until the Lutz family moved into that house and started making up all these stories, right? So when it right. first happened, it was just, you know, a, a kid that went nuts and killed his family, correct? Right. Yeah. His lawyer, his lawyer is the one that brought up the fact that he was possessed by the, by a demon. And I think that's where that whole horror thing came from. They were oh. trying to get him an insanity defense. Mm -hmm. So by claiming he was possessed by a demon, I guess uh, the movie The Exorcist had just come out too at that particular time. Yeah, The Exorcist came and, out in 73. Yeah. Yeah. So they were using that like he was possessed by a demon. And, you know, the lawyer tried running with that. And they had a psychiatrist obviously evaluate him. Even if he was possessed by a demon, he could have been um, uh, exercised and he probably would have had to, he would have been found guilty anyway. Yeah. Well, know? from what I understand, but, uh, the Lutzes the Lutz took the money and ran. <laughs> After yes. they got their deal, they moved wherever they moved. $60,000 they got for the rights. Right. And they sold it and left everything and everything behind and left yeah. and moved to California. And, the, and somebody else uh, bought the house. Yep. Exactly. And that's when they changed the address. And but it was never. Side windows. Yeah. It was hardly ever mentioned about the connection to the Genovese yep. family. Yep. And, and I don't know why. Comes in. And I don't know why. I don't either. Probably because, like I said earlier, the Genovese family tends to stay under the radar. Really, you don't ever hear or I don't ever remember hearing anything on the news about the Genovese family as opposed to the Gambinos. The Gambinos yeah. seem to be mostly in the newspapers, whereas the Genovese and the other families, you didn't, you don't hear about them. They're still going strong in New York City and Brooklyn, the Genovese family, whereas the Gambino yeah. family is and a major, a major part of history like this murder was mm -hmm. okay and they they made it that it shied away and it kept that family out of the spotlight because had it brought pete into it he would have had surveillance on him newspaper people on him reporters everything down in daddy's neighborhood back yeah then. i mean yes again he was a i was telling chris he was a small man Look like a homeless man the way he was dressed, but he was a very powerful man. He ran the neighborhood. He was our grandfather's best friend. Our grandfather died in 1947, and he picked up the pace. He uh, took care of my father and his brothers and sisters and watched over my grandmother. Got my father a job at New York Telephone. Got his uh, other brother. Uh, he got him in the boys club, and he got him a job as a coffee boy at ADT Burgo Alarm Systems, which eventually he got a career out of it. And he hooked up my aunt with her soon-to-be husband. The only one that oh, gave oh. him a problem was the youngest, my, my father's youngest brother, but he took care of the family. Yeah. And when I moved in with my father after I graduated, a week after I graduated, I met him, and he said to me, look, I'm going to get you a job 
in the Carpenters Benefit Funds, fill out the application. I'm going to push it through for you, but do not mention my name. I shook his hand. I said, thank you. And my father says to me, this was your grandfather's best friend. You know, you never met your grandfather. I says, nice to meet you, this and that. And that was the one and only time I spoke to the man. And that was it. He had, it looked like a 1920s type of suit on with, with the Yabba de Castello hat, a tie. And that was it. That was it. And yeah, he they was weren't powerful. Yeah. He had the Carpenters Union in his pocket. You know, he got so many people jobs in every Italian American neighborhood in the city. Everybody in the in the office itself, they would say, "Hey, you know, you got the job through Pete," and I would say, "Yeah, you know, oh, he was a good guy. He's a he's a good man." This and that. Everybody in that office got the job either through him or through somebody that he was with. Yeah. Now I have an article here that goes on to say that the Fayos crew was based out of Little Italy and the Genovese family's historic power bases were in Greenwich Village and East Harlem factions. Uh, the Bronx based Capos uh, with uh, Laborio Bellomo and Vincent DiNapoli. Um, most of his power was whittled away by them, especially in the construction and labor rackets, which is what he's talking about now. The um, mm -hmm. The labor unions, the carpenters union, DeFeo had a big hand in that. That's yep. how my brother Jimmy got the job at the carpenters union because DeFeo was shaking him down more or less. He was controlling them, and um, that's how DeFeo got in trouble. Was that they found out that he was connected to racketeering and um, issues with the the labor market with the carpenters union. Yes, and that's when he started, you know, basically being pushed out of the Genovese family because of the murders. And then in 1981, which was a couple of years after the murders happened, he was involved in this issue with the Carpenters Union. And and check this out. His nephew, Soapy Aguilino, was daddy's uh, best friend who he yes. was driving a truck with. He's the reason why we got the house in Lindenhurst because he moved out there first and said, that, said to daddy, you know, you're living in Elmont, there's houses being built in Lindenhurst. And that's why yeah. we moved to Lindenhurst. Mm -hmm. Pete's real name is uh, Philly Aquilino, says it in the article. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. And that's he's that's what we waited to. His Pete DeFay's uh, nephew through marriage is this guy, Thomas Maziata. He became the director of the benefit funds. And he had his son working there. And he was indirectly my boss. And then the father retired, and then the son took over. Right. But there were so many neighborhood people there, people from Bensonhurst, Maspeth, where you were from, uh, Chris, Staten Island, the Bronx. Yeah, I mean, man. that's how I met my 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 wife now. Through the, you know, she worked in the office with, uh, with me. Oh, really? Yeah, that's how we met. So what do you think? You think that... Uh... They were able to cover up the connection to the Genovese family, or do you just think um, that for some reason it never caught on in the media? Because the, the Genovese family was uh, especially good at um, staying under the radar and stuff. And I'm sure they can make it so that, you know, um, some of this stuff isn't getting reported on. But who knows? Well, it, got caught, uh, what, it got caught later on because the office was on 23rd off of 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. Then they bought the old uh, phone building off of Hudson Street, where my father used mm -hmm. to work when he was a kid, on Hudson Street. And we went down there. And then I think a year or two, there was an article in the paper. The, the president of the uh, local 1456, he moved his office in there. N name was Fred Devine. I was telling this Marie. The FBI came in, came in off the elevator. They made us all leave, and they interviewed each office worker one by one, and a lot of people lost their jobs, and they brought this company. I was already gone by then. They brought this company in from Chicago to take care of the benefit funds for the carpenters, and then they brought some people back from what I understand, but the office was run by the Genovese family. And then 
like again, it was the uh, it was the early '90s that this started making the daily news. We were working, and all the articles were coming out, and we were getting memos from the director saying, uh, "There's going to be an article coming out tomorrow. Disregard it. Uh, we're fighting it. This and that." And everybody be huddling around the you know the water cooler and reading this article. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I used to go all over. The, the city uh, to get checks signed for the Building Constructions Association, General Contractors Association. These were payoffs. Yeah, and then I used to bring yeah. them back to the office. Yeah. I was, I was, I was on the clock. They'd give me money for the subway or a cab. Vincent, can you do me a favor. You know, go to Forty Second Street, the Lincoln Building. Go to the General Contractors Association. It's on the 18th floor. See Ted King. He's going to sign these checks for you. Put it back in the envelope. Don't open them up and come back and, and, and give them to the fifth floor. That's where the union delegates were. Mm -hmm. I used to go up there. They used to ma make me a sandwich. So now I go back to my, my desk and I'd start working again. I was there for eight years. July 1st, 1984 to uh, I think it was September of 1991. That's when I got let go over an argument. Yeah. Yeah, this is all now, Pete DeFeo stuff. used to hang out yeah. at uh, the social club called the Alto Night Social Club, and that was on Kenmare and Mulberry Street. He did; he had no association with the Ravenites. No, but there was a social no. club on Kenmare and Mulberry. That's called right, the Alto Alto Social mm -hmm. Club, and that's where DeFeo was based out of. So, oh, okay. And then after he retired, see, he they retired Pete DeFeo. Mm -hmm. His next in command was a man named Alex Morelli. And they yes. called him Black Alex. My mother dated him when my mother yeah. was living around there. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because when I moved back in with my mother, I was still working there. I was taking the Long Island Railroad back and forth. And his name came up. So I says, Mom, you know a guy named Alex Morelli? She said, I know Alex. She goes, I dated him. Now, I didn't believe her because my mother was starting to get sick at that time. Yeah. So I asked my father. I says, Dad, did Mom date Alex? Because my father and Alex are really close. My father and Alex had a cafe on Spring and Mulberry together. Maria will tell you. Yes. And my father says, yeah, they dated. But I put a stop to it because my father was madly crazy in love with my mother back then. You're talking about in the late 50s and 60s. This and that. So there's another connection. And he became a captain in the, in the family, Alex. And then he ran the neighborhood after Pete died. This and that. Gotcha. So these all these like alleys that connects indirectly back to my father's family and me when I got older. So see this this shit is all fascinating to me because I've um I for a while there took a, a major interest in, in the whole story of the, the Amityville horror and I read a little bit about the DeFeo family. I knew there was a connection there. <clears throat> but I certainly didn't know all this. And I want to talk more about the mob stuff, too. But what can you tell us? Because you guys seem to know a lot. I didn't realize how uh, well-versed you were in, in this subject. But what can you tell us about the Lutz family? Because they're kind of the reason for why we even know anything about the Amityville Horror, why we ever even heard of it, is basically because of the Lutz family. That's Marie's end of it. She She's seen the movie and wrote the book. Yeah. Is, and I've done a lot of research on them. From what I understand, the wife, Mrs. Lutz, has some kind of psychic ability, supposedly. And these spirits that were in the house were Spirit. contacting her to try to be free from the house or whatever the case may be. And she was the one that witnessed a lot of these things and actually convinced her husband that these things were going on. He never seen them himself. She was telling him that these things were going on, and he believed her. Um, for instance, um, they had poor heating in the house. Uh, the house was, was old, and the heating wasn't very good. And where the sewing room was, which is a room she spent a lot of time in, um, during the winter, it would get cold. So that room would get colder than the rest of the house. She uh, said that it was cold like that because of the spirits were in the house, yeah. and that's why the room was so cold and um, uh, there was, uh, something to do with some kind of, uh, bugs or something that were coming out of the woodwork and, um, chairs were moving, um, 
the walls were weeping, like not not blood, but like weeping tears. Um, <laughs> Something just, just moved behind me. Crazy. Hey, my God. Yeah. <laughs> and and then the kids, of course, the kids are going to listen to what mom is saying. So they're singing, you know, um, I think there was a girl named Jody. Uh, supposedly this was a, um, in the movie, they got a girl named Jody DeFeo, who is not related. She That person never existed. But in one of the movies, they have a Jody DeFeo as one of the family what, members who was killed. Supposedly this Jody DeFeo was uh, some aberration that the little girl, the daughter of the Lusses, um, had this, you know, uh, made up friend kind of thing, you know, where, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? An invisible friend. And she called it Jody. And that's where that came from. Um, but other than that, they lasted 28 days in that house. Um, they had a couple of seances and nothing ever came of it. Um, and they just got a hold of some publisher or some publisher found out about what was going on and they ran with the story and that's how it all came to be. But again, they lived in that house for 28 days and that was it. They, they fled, they, with the clothes on their back, they just left. And that well, was it. Th this is what I wanted to ask you about what you were saying in the beginning. Um, do you really think she convinced him these things were happening? Or do you think they both had that plan when they bought the house to just make up this bullshit story and get famous off of it? That's a possibility. That's a very feasible possibility. I mean, I, I, the way I feel about the supernatural, I don't think I would put myself in that kind of position and live in a house and, you know, cause that kind of stress to my family, you know, where you got to flee after 28 days, but it could have been some kind of ploy to get money. I mean, I'm sure maybe the guy had friends and connections with publishers, the, you know, the husband, the Lutz. Well, back, had back then, $60,000, that was a lot of money back then. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I Absolutely, mean, they didn't even pay yeah. that much for the house and that's how much they got for the book rights. Was he trying to get any sort of royalties, uh, Ron, when he was when he was in prison? Yes, he, did. he was trying to get he it. Actually, Ron DeFeo actually won a lawsuit while he was in prison. The first couple of years he was in prison, right? He actually won a three hundred dollar lawsuit against the prison because the prison officials kept him locked in his cell for five days in December of nineteen seventy six. I think it was or seventy seven. And he sued the prison and won three hundred dollars from them for the fact that prison officials left him locked in his cell for five days straight and didn't let him out. And he sued the prison and won three hundred dollars. Now was he a so model? After paying the law, he probably got like eleven dollars out of that. Right. Yeah, three hundred exactly. bucks is a lot of fucking money when you're in jail, though. Yeah, exactly. I guess commissary must have been cheap back then, yeah. you know. Now was he a model prisoner? Yeah. Did, did he give any any problems while he was in jail? And oh, they kept him separate. No, he was he was in general popular. He was a celebrity. He was a big celebrity. Everybody knew. Uh, people were pointing him out. This is Ron even for DeFeo. killing his uh, his mother and his sisters. Yeah. What? Even for killing Said his mother again? and his sisters. Yeah, he was a celebrity. Yeah, it was, you know, I mean, he killed six people. I mean, you either get friendly with the guy or you stay out of his way. It's one or the other. Yeah, no but shit. Yeah, he was a celebrity. Because I know they they attacked Berkowitz in the he prison. He was in a different state. prison. Yeah, he was in a different prison. He's in, he was Sam. up in Solon County. Yeah. They gave him a beat. It was a different prison. Yeah, they can't have too many celebrities in the same prison. But there's also a rumor that um, DeFeo was secretly married. Yeah, I mean, in the comments. Yeah. Some woman. Um, and supposedly the family um, had the marriage annulled because they didn't want her uh, to be prosecuted. or Because I think he was saying that she had something to do with it, too, with the murders. And they didn't want to prosecute it, so they got married to avoid the prosecution. And then after he was sentenced or convicted, that's when the marriage was dissolved. But I don't, I don't know too much about that. Well, I remember okay. Dad saying to me, "If you ever do see Pete in the neighborhood, don't ever go over to him and say, well, Dad, I only spoke to him once. I'm going to go over to him and say, how's your nephew?'" He said he disowned him, and oh, yeah. Doesn't doesn't even mention his name. He goes, everybody was told, don't even bring it up. He's embarrassed by it. And it's 
you know, it wiped out his whole family. So this was his great nephew, not his brother. Senior was the senior was Pete DeFeo's nephew. Ron Jr., the murderer, was the great nephew. And yes, dad said it was his brother. Gotcha. No, Pete DeFeo and Ron Senior are, ne- are uncle and nephew. That's and then Ron Jr. is the great nephew. But the family ties were still there because Ron. Um, Pete DeFeo and the nephew senior still seen each other. I mean, that's the way Italian families are. You know, you, you know, your uncles, your aunts, you know, you have dinner with them, you, yeah. Yeah. you know, celebrate holidays and all that. And they lived in Brooklyn. They all lived in Brooklyn. So they were all close. They all seen each other all the time. Well, I they remember the DeFeo dealership over there. I remember the dealership was on Sunrise Highway mm-hmm. and it was an Oldsmobile dealership and mommy yeah. and daddy bought the, uh, the Tornado. Yep. From them. Mm-hmm. The yep. Fayo Old the Fayo Oldsmobile. The Fayo Auto, yep. No, mm-hmm. Oldsmobile. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. You see this, Chris? I mean, I this is unbelievable. Yeah, it is. I I was I, telling I, I was looking week, forward to this. I was telling I wish we would have done this ago. on Halloween. <laughs> I was That's telling me a couple weeks ago. Last week. I was yeah. telling me a couple weeks ago. What's next? The Kennedy assassination? Why not? <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm this sure would have been cool. Lee Harvey Oswald too, I'm sure of it somehow. Yeah, this would have been cool to do on Halloween. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. But we're still close enough. Halloween just passed. Absolutely. Um, I'm definitely watching uh, some Amityville horror uh, either tonight or tomorrow. One of the movies. There's I so guess many, I'm gonna, many movies. You know, jump in and watch it. You know, I, I mean, mean, once you know the backstory and the truth of it, you watch the movie. That's when you can kind of say, "Wow, that you come on, that didn't happen." I mean, the movie's scary, and of course, they're trying to sell movie tickets, so they're going to, you know, do theatrics. That's just the way it is, but... Um, do they mention him happening. in the movie? Ron? No, that's the problem. The, the DeFeos are not mentioned at all. There's only a slight reference, and I don't know what which version of the movie. I think there's like four or five different... Avenue one, two, three, so on and so forth, um, that there's a mention of this Jody DeFeo. And that's about as far as the DeFeo mention is. It's strictly about the Luxes and their experience in the house. They touch on the fact that there was murders that occurred in the house, but they don't really, that part of the story isn't really. Uh, I thought the movie started, started out with, I thought the movie started out with the murder scene. Yeah, but there's no mention of the DeFeos themselves, just the oh, okay. murder. I yeah, there's you. no mention yeah, yeah. of the actual family. Well, yeah, now, it's the funniest. Oh, go ahead, Jimmy. No, no, go ahead, Chris. No, I was going to say the funniest thing about this story when I was reading up on it and stuff a while back is that, like I said, this wouldn't have been. I mean, obviously, you know, the guy kills his family. It would have been highly publicized and stuff. But it was really the Lutz family and all their bullshit that made this such a famous story and, and the book and the, all the fucking movies. And who knows? There might even be more movies. I, I don't know if it'll ever end. But. It was really the Lutzes that kind of blew this whole thing up with their, you know, with their story and and what they claim happened in that house. And I personally think it was just the guy who killed his family and nothing happened after that. There's still people living there till this day. So, yeah, yeah, that's how, you know, it was bullshit because if the Lutzes had a problem in that house, how come everybody after them didn't? And he turned around in one of his uh, later interviews that he took the cross of St. Mary and he put it over the youngest sister's neck and then he left. Mm-hmm. That's BS. Because yeah. she was sleeping when he killed her. That, that much he admitted. But he killed the one sister in the hallway and the parents in the bedroom. And I, I didn't know about the brother and this and that. But is, is that any truth to that? That he put a medallion over the, the younger sister? And then, and she had autism. There was uh, the sister was sick, the younger one. Yes, yes, uh-huh. yes. But there was a total of sixteen films made about the Amityville. Sixteen horror. films. Sixteen Jesus different Christ. films. It, I mean, it spawned a franchise. Absolutely. Um, it came out in nineteen seventy nine. It was a book written by Jay Anson, uh, the Amityville Horror. Nineteen seventy seven. It came out. 
the family uh, lived there, and the Lutzes lived in there in 1975. They lasted 28 days and hightailed it out of there after that. Um, let me see. The, the, the Fayo family bought the house in 1965, and they, the murders happened on November 13th, 1974. And that's it. I mean, it goes Amityville 2, the possession, murder in Amityville, Amityville 2. Um, high hopes, the Amityville murders. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Wow. Let's see. They called it a crazy house. The Fails lived in a crazy house. It was constant yellow uh, yelling and screaming. The neighbors heard screaming and yelling constantly over at the house, which is the father, obviously. The sick yeah, father. I heard he was very abusive. Yes. Yes. But yeah. Now, as far as the house, uh, people, I saw somebody comment that the people don't stay long that move in there. Is that true? Has that house had a lot of owners since? The I'm losses? not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. I mean, the last that I understood was that somebody bought the house. They, after they changed the address and they re, um, redid the front of the house, there's two um, half moon. There were two half moon windows on yeah, yeah. the side of the house. They removed those windows because it was a very identifying feature of the house. So the owners that bought it after the Lutzes moved out, um, and I don't know when this was, but they had that facade removed and the address was changed. And I believe there is a family that's been living in there the whole time. Um, whether they know about the story or they don't, I, I don't know. I'm sure they do, but... You know, maybe they just don't have psychic powers and aren't being possessed by the walls bleeding. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Walter Showback says one owner died in 9-11. Wonder if that's Okay, see, I, I don't know yeah, anything about it. That's very possible. It's very po I mean, Amityville isn't far from New York City. Look what look what uh, Boston Red said. The Amit Leeville horror. <laughs> Lee. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, here's here's the funny thing. When I started clubbing, <laughs> when I moved in with my father and I started going to clubs in Manhattan and I'd you know, meet girls, whatever, and they would say, well, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm originally from Long Island. Where? Lindenhurst. Where's Lindenhurst? Did you ever hear of Amityville? The Amityville Hall? Yeah. Two towns away. Nobody yeah. never heard of Lindenhurst unless you heard of Pat Benatar. This and that. Yeah. yeah but Pat if you Benatar mentioned Amityville... Amityville and you said it was two. Then they knew. If Amityville never existed, nobody never heard of Lindenhurst. Massapequa, maybe. Lindenhurst, Amityville put those other two towns, Copen and Lindenhurst, on the map because it was in that area. Well, actually, now that you mentioned Massapequa, the morning after the murder, well, the the murders happened around two or three in the morning. Later on that day, supposedly Ron Jr. picked up his girlfriend at the time and they went to the Massapequa Mall. You know that mall, Jimmy. Sunrise Mall. And they, oh, they yeah. spent a good couple of hours at the Massapequa Mall. And there was, um, from what I understand, there was, um, uh, at the time that I think they were looking for him, there was a bolo out for him, a be on the lookout for him. Because uh, they, they didn't know if he was maybe murdered pull. or whatever. They, so yeah, he didn't pull they, back they didn't know to what uh, he did go back to Brooklyn. Actually, what happened was he went back to Brooklyn to a bar and he had a couple more drinks. He got drunk and he made phone calls to the house. He started calling the house. No one answered it. Obviously, they're all dead. He called several times around six or seven that evening. He supposedly went back to the house with a friend and started screaming that his family was dead. His family was dead, that the mob came okay. and okay. killed his family. Mm -hmm. That's where the mob comes in. And then that's where Pete DeFeo comes in. They, you know, and there was a slight investigation, very right. small, but the the police in Amityville knew that the mafia doesn't kill children and wives. Yeah. You know, they may have killed the father or maybe, you know, Ron Jr., but they don't kill a whole family. They just don't do that. So that whole mob connection was was squashed almost immediately. But it was brought up. And that's where Pete DeFeo got involved in this whole thing. Now, when he took the jewelry off his father's dead body. Yes. Yeah. They didn't find they didn't find his prints because he didn't have a record back then. No. 
Mm-mm. And what did he, he do? What trouble. did he do with his father's uh, jewelry? I know he tried selling. I believe it. he hocked it. Yeah, he hocked it or he sold it. Yeah, yeah. Do you believe this, Chris? Yeah, I mean, he killed his father. That. He took he took all his money, his jewelry, his car keys, and he and he tailed it out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He That's put a gun right to his sister's face. Her, the sister woke up supposedly. Uh, the one in the bedroom. In her room, she kind of woke up, and he pointed the gun right in her face and blew her head off. I know that that fucking part is. I mean, the whole thing's heartbreaking, but that shit makes me sick. Yeah. Really but what does. I don't what I what I don't understand is how he killed the father. They were struggling. Right. How did he reload that shotgun and kill the mother, and then his sister in the hallway? Supposedly, where were the, where were the, where were the God, shells? In his pocket. I don't know. The, the father. Know, the father went it. in the closet to get the gun. Yeah. It was the father that initially got the shotgun. I believe in, uh, I don't know if it's sure or not, and it's never been written about, but I believe he planned all this. I do believe he was planning to kill his family. I mean, the abuse that oh, he was yeah. putting up with, with his father. Yeah, he just know, wanted I'm to sure kill the father for, what, for yeah. what daddy told me. But yeah. the father went in the closet and, and got, got the shotgun out because he got tired of him coming home high, whatever the hell he was coming home with, and doing what he was doing. He must have had access to the shotgun shells. He had to have. I mean, he had them in his pocket. I mean, what is it? A double barrel shotgun he used? So what is that hold? I don't, I don't know. I never, is that what he used? Is that what he used? I believe it was a double barrel shotgun. Yeah. I mean, he blew holes in these people in his family. So, so mean, how many people, how many shots? He would have had to reload um, every two shots. So how many one shots? and two shots apiece. I think the, the mother had two shots. One in the back. And one in the head, I think. The father had two shots. The children, the four kids, uh, each had one shot each, I believe. And one of the sisters, not the one that was in the hallway, but one that was in bed, actually heard him come in the room. And she turned around and looked at him, and he just shot her right in the face. And that was it. Now, the and father was, was a big man. Yeah. 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 So it must have taken more than one one shot to, to, to drop yeah, them. The parents each had two shots each. The kids were, I believe, one shot. I mean, that's what you do. You, you hit them once with a good shot and they're dead. But what, I don't, I don't care what police, drug you're on. Yeah. Look, I, I did my share with drugs and, you know, you just know that. You wake up in an instant, okay? When, when you do something like that, you're sober in a second. Well, he Especially he was high yeah. on marijuana. He wasn't no, he said he, he said he was he on was. LSD. That's what he yeah, said. He, yes, he said he liked it. Yes, I yes. never did LSD, but he must have woken up in a second when he when he first killed his father. Because to reload that shotgun, you got to have some sort of you got to know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because I heard some nightmare stories yeah, about LSD. Well, yeah, LSD. I had a bad trip once. It is a fucking nightmare. But so you're talking about what? It's three kids, right? Four kids, two kids, two boys and two girls he killed. Four kids. Yeah. So at least one shot for each kid. Right. So that's four shots. And then uh, two for each parent. Right. That's another four shots. So eight shots. So he had to reload four times. Yep. Yep. And he knew exactly what he, and he, he was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He was, um, you know, direct. He went to the parents' room. He went to the brothers' room. He went to the sisters' room. He went to the brothers' room, and then he killed the sister in the hallway. I mean, it was, you know, Bing, 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 and that was it. He went through the whole house. It was like one after the other after the other. You know, there was no pause in between. It's he just went about killing his family, and that was it. Yeah, that's uh. That's cra- uh, crazy. P- Pazzo says the Lux's Lux lawyer agreed. admitted it was it was a fraud. That yeah. is true, isn't it? He did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but back yeah. to what you were saying, though. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's a sick story, and I'm, I'm glad the dude just died in prison. Uh, at least yeah. that's some good news. Yeah. But I I personally think you know uh, I don't believe that any drug had anything to do with it. I think he uh, either just snapped that night and said. Fuck it, I'm going to do it, which he had probably been thinking about for a long time, yeah. or he really had it planned. Now, isn't there some, um, I know you mentioned, you know, maybe taking a train in, I think you said, but isn't yeah. there, uh, 
something that has to do with the timeline or the travel, the way he got there and all that, that night that would lead you to believe it was planned. I forget what they said about that. Well, the Long Island Railroad train station is right there. That's why I'm saying that maybe he took the train. He could have taken car service or yeah. somebody, maybe that friend that he was supposedly with drove him there and ditched the car or something. But I know he didn't, he said that he ne- he didn't have a driver's license. And you didn't need one back then anyway. I mean, yeah. really, you didn't need a driver's license. I mean, look at Elite. He didn't need a driver's license. He was chauffeuring uh, Gotti around at 12 years old. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you think there's I mean, any it, chance a light uh, he could have been Robert there. Feo Jr. up to this? He could have been I there. I think A-Light yeah. might be involved somehow. But... I think that, that bracelet that he wears could have been, you know, the father's. The uh... Feo's fault, yeah. Yeah, it could have been. And he was going to give him a baseball bat. He was going to give Ron Jr. a baseball bat, and Ron Jr. said, no, I'd rather do it with a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit! And was it was it was it Anthony Raymundi or Tony Pizza that supplied the rifle? I think it was Pizza. It had to have been Pizza. <laughs> He's the only person that would stoop to that level. Supposedly, he lived out there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. That's right. That's funny. <laughs> I knew I knew those three had to be behind it somehow. Um. So, yeah, so this was all fascinating shit, man. I love hearing yep. stuff like this because, uh, obviously, like you said, that's a part of history and all the movies and shit about it. Everybody knows about the Amityville Horror, no matter what age you are. I mean, you you know about that story. So, um, but you look like you had something else, Murray. No, I'm just, I'm just reading over here where it says um, his father like trusted him with making a $20,000 deposit. From the car lot, he had, uh, I guess, $14,000 in checks and $6,000 in cash. That's how the whole mafia thing got involved. He told his father that he got robbed, that the mob robbed him. And supposedly this was mob money that was robbed. So hence, the mob money that was robbed is why the mob, meaning his uncle, went and killed the family. Because this $20,000 in supposed mob money was robbed. When Pete DeFeo probably had a hell of a LSD trip with uh, twenty thousand dollars. Meanwhile, I don't think Pete DeFeo, like our uncle, I mean our great uncle Nettie, never left that neighborhood. No, never left. Never left Little Italy. No, he lived. He lived in the neighborhood, and if he went anywhere, he took the subway. Okay, this yeah, is where it um, says. Um, in the after he killed the family, he says he complained to both people, um, his girlfriend Sherry Klein and Bobby Kelsky, that he wasn't able to get in touch with his family. He said that all the cars were in the garage, but that no one was answering the phone. He even called home in front of his girlfriend at 6 p.m. He was sitting in Henry's bar, which was not too far from his house. He tried to call home again and complained to friends about getting no answer. He said that he was going to go home and break into the house through a window. At around 6.30 p.m., he returned to the bar. He called out the patrons, saying that his parents had been shot. A group of his friends left the bar with him. They went to the house and discovered that the family was dead. A friend of his, Joseph Yesser, is the person that called the police. And that was one of the neighbors. family members were found in their beds, in the bed, right. dead. Unbelievable. Now, according, Mur- according oh, I'm to- sorry, the murder weapon was a 35 caliber Marlin rifle. So it was a rifle. It's a rifle. Which is only what? One or two shots? One you shot. You have to reload each time. Yeah. It's one shot for a rifle? Well, you got to. You, you got to uh, reload each time. Yeah. Yeah. So he had to reload each times it. then. You know, you got to, yeah. you know, every time you got to cock it back. I, I don't, I don't know anything about rifle. Says the parents were shot twice and each of the children once. Um, now, according know. according to Dad, when when Daddy told me the story, mm-hmm. when he went to the house, the police said they they think it's a family member. Yeah, and they think it, and he was this was two days after the murders, mm-hmm. so he had a two day head start when yes. supposedly like you know again he was in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Now my guess is whatever jewelry again he took off the father. He haunted. 
he was looking to get money. From what I understand, he was looking to just to disappear. I mean, I don't know if he had any family in Brooklyn that could he go that he could have went to. He certainly wasn't going to go to the neighborhood. Yeah. Nobody's going to help him there. No, no. And his friends kind of had a feeling something wasn't right with him. I guess when he comes back to the bar and he's acting all crazy and stuff and. You know, he's setting the whole thing up, you know, acting like his parents aren't answering the phone. Everybody's home. What's going on? I mean, so he knew what he was doing. Even so, he may have been high on LSD. He still knew what he was doing. I'm sorry. I don't believe he, you know, he was possessed by anything other than his own conscience. Yeah. But well, just, what made him think he could get away with this? If he wasn't out of his mind when he did it. I mean, what made, he obviously wasn't out of his mind, though, right? Because he tried to get away with it, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he he knew you know he knew what he was doing. But what made him think he could pull this shit off? What I think, as a kid, he was able to get away with all of this bad behavior that he had all his life, you know, with his parents, and he obviously got away with it with them. And he probably thinks, oh well, you know, the cops are going to believe my crappy story too, and I'll get away with it. And if I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think he even thought about the consequences of his actions. I mean, and he wasn't young. He was 23 years old when he did this. So he wasn't, he wasn't a baby. You know, he was an adult and should have known that, you know, con- actions have consequences. And But I don't think he gave a shit. How long did he spend in South Oaks before they put him in an adult prison? Um, and a sanity plea didn't last that long from what I understand. No, no, no. Because the prosecution put on a, 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 a witness, a psychiatrist that said he's full of shit. There's nothing wrong with him. He may be psychotic and have bipolar or schizophrenia, but he knew exactly what he was doing. He may have been high on this or that, but you can't use drug 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 abuse as a defense for crimes. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't like be high on cocaine and say, well, you know, I threw somebody off the bridge because I was antsy on yeah. cocaine and please forgive me, you know. I didn't mean to do it. You're going to jail, man. Yeah. And South Oaks was, was basically a country club back then. Yeah, yeah. It was called the, um, what do they call it? The Thorazine Shuffle he was doing back then. Oh, he was heavily sedated. I know about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was taking Oxycontin in prison. They were giving him Oxycontin, which is very hard to believe that in a prison they give you opiates. But again, 1970s, you know. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, they gave people worse back then. I know. Um, yeah. I don't know, but I think, like you said, uh, you know, about with the spoiled kid thing, I mean, they once you, when you're like that, when you've gotten away with everything or you're always getting coddled, you know, you think you can get away with anything. You think you're kind of like yeah. invincible, like somebody's always going to exactly. get you out of trouble. That's but, exactly um, it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And um, I think the Lutzes just kind of maybe they knew the story in the house. They knew what happened and somebody convinced them, look, you know, you can make money over here. You know, the seventies, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't really remember much about it other than um, it was a slower time, but you know, I know the exorcist had just come out, like I said, and you know, maybe they figured, Hey, we can make money on this, you know, let's make up a bunch of shit and make money. How fast was that? How fast was that book written? Um, they moved in in 75. I think the book was written in 77. So it took them and the two movie years came to out in 79? 79. The movie came out in 79. And the book came out, I think it was 70, 77. And the movie, the movie made, made uh, a lot of money. Oh, yeah. It's still making money. Are you kidding me? Especially with Halloween just being on. I've seen it on Showtime. It... Uh, they had uh, a couple of them on. Let me see. I never had an inkling to even watch one minute of it. Yeah. I had no interest. Yeah. yeah. And what was the, uh, what was the cause of uh, his death? I believe it was natural causes. That's what they're claiming. But um, 69 years old? 69. Well, you know, he, again, he was on opiates all his life. His liver probably crapped out. You know, I mean, they kept him sedated. Um, you know. Well, I know he he did an interview before COVID, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget who did it, and he did say that he was he was dying, and he Not wanted to get yeah. he wanted to get the truth out, mm-hmm. and he wanted somebody to to believe him. And I don't know. That was the last interview that I seen that a reporter gave him. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I forget who it might have been Diane Sawyer. It might might have been somebody else. But he looked frail, and it was outside. You know, in the courtyard, and he did say he didn't have that much, that much time left. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just looked it up, and it says, uh, you know, he died March 12, twenty twenty one, at Albany Medical Center. It says official cause of death is yet to be determined, which is also funny because March. It's a long fucking time since March. Yeah. They haven't figured it out yeah. yet. Yeah. That you're hiding something. Something happened, you Something's know, uh, right. whether another inmate beat the oh, shit out of him, you know, or well, somebody had to claim to somebody had to claim his body. I mean, I'm sure he's got some family left. They put Can't him in somebody field. No, they put him in. Yeah, he field. probably is. A, the yeah, I agree, Marie, because what family member would even want to uh, give him any kind of decent burial or anything? Um, I, yeah, that's no. that's exactly where he is. I guarantee it. Potter's field. Yeah. Yeah, with no headstone, no nothing, no recognition. It's a shame. I mean, it's a waste of a human life, but still, it's terrible. Yeah, it is. You know, it's funny with these fucking guys, these scumbags that do shit like this, you know, uh, kill their whole families, you know, commit mass murder, whatever it is. They're made so famous and legendary after they do something like this that it just gives, it gives the next psychopath uh, more motivation to do something just like it because they know they'll get all this recognition, books, Absolutely. movies, everything. It's crazy. Negative attention is still attention. Doesn't matter. You and know, and like some people really. Behaves. Yeah, and some people really just don't give a fuck about jail. So, you know what I mean? It's like, why not? That's, uh, uh, that's what this you, world's you know, coming you, to. But you know, you always get a copycat. Oh, my God, yes. Yeah, absolutely. But these days, though, I'll be perfectly honest with you. If that whole thing took place in in 2021, I don't even think we'd hear about it. It's so shit like that is so common now. Yeah, we wouldn't even think twice about it. I know. I mean, with all the school shootings that go on now and uh, these crazy idiots who get a hold of guns and just start shooting people in the middle of the street for no reason. I mean, this is nothing. This is like kindergarten murder. It wouldn't even make a fucking a national newspaper. It'd be like, oh, a guy, a guy killed his whole family in Long Island. All right, what's next? Yeah. Like, what's next? <laughs> exactly. It's sad. Yeah, it really it's is. You know, a whole family, young, young kids who didn't get a chance to live their life, 12, 13 year old kids that couldn't get to live their life. Really sad. Yeah, I know. It makes me sick. Boston Red said, some people don't care about Jill. <laughs> that's that's Jill. him making fun of Lee Cole's accent. Jill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you guys He'll think about... Uh, someday. Yeah, what do you guys think about what's going on with these two guys, Lee and Tony? You know, and Marie will, will attest to this. He was talking the other day about this Sons of Italy hall on Sunrise Highway, this pizza face. Yeah. Our brother used to work One was on Deer Park Avenue And our older brother Joey Worked in it So there he's I caught him in a lie right then and there And a few other things that he was talking about Because he brought up Lindenhurst Marie. Did so he that. really? Yeah, and there was no Sons of Italy Hall on Sunrise Highway in Lindenhurst No okay? It was in Deer Park yeah. Avenue Because that was an Italian strip And yes. Joey was the custodian there When he was living with uh, Helen and Al Yes Mm-hmm and then he was talking about a few other things, but he looks so familiar. Like he, he worked in a carnival out there or something. That's what he looks like a carnival. Worker. <laughs> he was a clown. He is. He is. My, 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 my right, Chris? He's a clown. Yeah, he's a he, real clown. Well, he no, he said like, that he's, he traveled around and worked carnivals. That's how he knew the city that I, that I lived in for the last 20 something years is that he used to come here and work the carnival. So he really is a carny. I, that's what I think where I seen him from. That's so funny you said that. Oh, shit. That's the headline on MobTube today. The Sorelli's no Tony Pizza from no, the, the Corny. Corny. 
my yeah, God. Corny. See, and corny people have bad backgrounds. I mean, they ain't traveling around the world for no reason, you know, around the country for no reason. They're on the run from something. Absolutely. That's the best way to do it. I mean, he's getting, he's getting, he's getting meals. He's getting, he's making like a lot of fuzzles a day. I don't understand who, who's giving him this money. Give it to me. Suckers. Yeah, the carnival. Yeah. Oh, shit. Unbelievable. And what else is this guy saying? I mean, what is he doing? Oh, it's something new every day, but it's usually about me or my wife or Josie or Jimmy Clans. Oh, Same as Lee. It's just a homeless version of Lee. That's all it is. Oh, my God. <laughs> Lee Cole is a piece of shit. You don't talk about somebody else's wife. You just don't do that. And if he wants to act like a mob guy or think he's some kind of mob expert or whatever he thinks he is, that's the last thing that those guys do. They do not talk about men's wives. They just they don't talk about the families and they no. don't talk about wives. They don't do that shit. They got a beef with you, that's one thing, but they don't bring the family into it. They just don't do it. I, I mean, agree. it's the same thing with the DeFeos, with them accusing with Ron accusing the mob of killing the family. They don't do stuff like that. They just don't. They may break your kneecaps if you don't pay them back or shoot you in the head, but they ain't going to go after your family. And they, this guy should not be going after your wife. Shanna is a wonderful person. We need more people like her oh, in yeah. this world. Oh, yeah. I mean, she, she probably helps so many people. She probably has no idea how many people she has helped with her podcast. Well, she's she's just absolutely a target. wonderful person. And Thank anybody who talks bad that, about man. her is a piece of shit. Oh, yeah. I agree. Oh, yeah. Thank hey, you both for saying What are you that. trying to prove? That. What is this Lee Cole? 60-something years old? I heard he's right. got a son and a daughter. His he's brother retired. committed suicide. He's retired. He's retired. Yeah, yeah, he's retired. He collects disability. He's retired. And the other chooch is my age? Retired from life. Retired from life. The other chooch is my age? He's 55? Yeah, 55. Yeah. So we can't drive 55. <laughs> he can't walk. He weighs 300 freaking pounds. Who, Lee? Yeah, I know. That's that's why why pizza? Uh, pizza Man, whatever his name is. He's, he's no, Lee weighs 300 pounds. Oh, well, Lee weighs 300 pounds. Yeah. But, Tony, how about this for you guys? Either. You guys were all around all these neighborhoods in New York during that time period. Jimmy, you're, you're Tony Pizza's age. You ever hear of this guy? Never. Never. I don't know. know. I mean, I there's there's people. Work. I spoke with uh, with Jimmy. I went on his uh, his show. I, I think two Sundays ago, mm -hmm. and there's a guy, uh, my father's girlfriend's nephew. This guy Frankie Pigeon. I think it's the same guy that he he used to hang with, and he used to come into my neighborhood. Guys like that that we might know, but this clown. He's like a cockroach. He crawled out of the woodwork, and all of a sudden, he's all this. He knows all this stuff about stuff. He doesn't know anything because yeah. I bet you when it came down to it, he probably that 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 stutter. He wouldn't even know what he's <laughs> talking about. What I don't understand is how did he get Sammy Govano on the phone? He must have told well, him he knew John A. Light. <laughs> there's a lot of different ways. I mean, they might know each other in passing, but from what I heard, uh, he just. They, they kind of connected on Facebook. Sammy felt bad for him because he was a homeless guy. He sent him some money. And I think they may, might have started corresponding that way. But you could also pay. It's on fucking Sammy's uh, uh, website. You could pay, and, and he'll give you a personal phone call. So uh, let me read this real quick. Oh. Sal Army, 9.99. Tony is going to say you got no content. You need the Sorellis. Of course he is. You don't think Tony, or I don't think Tony's homeless. I think he's making uh, plenty of money and staying in hotels. Yeah, probably. I'm still waiting for the day we find out this guy hasn't been homeless yet. And uh, yeah, right. He's probably living in a freaking mansion down in Miami. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Well, he's from a I rich, rich either. family. Well, either he's they a, disowned him, or he's a liar. Yeah, yeah. Um, U.S. Army combat medic. FP, they did disown him. His family fucking hates him. Um, the best part, Pizza Jaw dumped Lee Cole. When did that happen? Tonight? Did he turn on Lee? Who had the over-under? I think I said uh, 48 hours, didn't I? That's funny. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I don't know. He, These guys are... pushing um, you out for not tipping 
for you candy apples and funnel cakes. Ha ha ha. Fucking Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan Canada, you're a trip. That's yeah, he true. would be. Yeah, he's funny. Did you ever hear him, guys, when he yells at people because they're not giving him enough free money? No. I, I, oh. don't, I, I don't see him. I've never seen him. Cole, I've seen, but not him. What has he got? His own podcast? What he's got a channel. Right here. Here? You know who Cole reminds you know who Cole reminds me of? Remember the Waltons? No, you know who he reminds me of? They said it earlier. You know the BTK killer? The buying torture kill guy? <laughs> no. Just a fat version of him. No. He looks just like him. You remember the you remember the, uh, the show when we were growing up, the Waltons? Grandpa? Yes. Yes. He looks like a 2021 grandpa from the Waltons with no hair. No teeth. And no, no teeth. teeth. And no hair. Well, something from Hee Haw. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is he kidding me? Up, he probably eats a pound of pancakes every morning with bacon and all oh, the other high cholesterol stuff. Unbelievable. And he probably, can't even, probably, can't even fit in, probably can't even fit into the shower to clean himself. Oh God, that's disgusting. That's a, I don't I don't want that image in my head. Oh please. It's it's sad. Holy you shouldn't shit. be talking about somebody's wife. I'm sorry, you just shouldn't do it. You no. know, I mean Are you talking about today, uh, he doesn't even know? He doesn't even know that his brother Yeah, that's that's um, grandpa in the middle there, Chris. Yeah. So if he was him. bald, holy shit. That's he him. Really does look like yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's grandpa. That's that's Lee. That's yeah. him. Oh. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that really does look exactly fucking like him. If you shaved his head, it was adorable. In this game. Chris, can you crop oh, that and, and 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 put that uh, up? Can I? I'll do it right now. <laughs> oh my god, that's nuts! I can't believe that you hit it right on the fucking head, Jimmy. Yeah, he's good with that. <sighs> Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. We got to put, but I got to Photoshop it. I'll, I'll make him bald and I'll throw in a big giant mole. Oh, there you go. With hair on it. Yeah. Oh, thanks for reminding me. What? Chris had the, the nice gesture of making us the shirt for us. Oh, so I got to the other one. Can everybody see it? Can you see yep. it? There you go. Uh -huh. Isn't that nice? It's a Sorelli thing you wouldn't understand, and it says Fat Bald Sicilian. Yep. Those shirts are awesome. So yep. if anybody's interested, uh, Marie's in charge. <laughs> Drop me an email. That's right. Sorelli Marie. And I'll send you guys. And, and Chris, Chris gets a percentage. Mm -hmm. What is Absolutely. it again, Marie? Sorelli Marie 63 at gmail.com. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'll send you guys back the original. I'll do it tomorrow. I forgot. I don't worry about that. I don't worry about that. No, I sent fine. them the new shirt and forgot to send back the original. Um, let me see. And we'll give, we'll give Chris his 30%, the 40%, 50%. No, no, Absolutely. no. I don't want anything. Absolutely. Absolutely not. I wouldn't accept the dime. Oh, please. Yeah. Um, it's a nice shirt. Nice shirt. I, I like how it came out. Yeah, I think it came out good too. I mean, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to put this up on the screen. This is so funny. Miss Can't Be Wrong said, I want a shirt, damn it. I'll you get my merch out too, guys. There you go. Uh, Miss Can't Be Wrong. Yeah, Tim Egan, or uh, who said it? Uh Sons of Hawaii. I'll get some merch eventually. Uh, when I can afford to uh buy a whole bunch of stuff. Yes, Miss Can't Be sure. Wrong. You can email me. Yes. Sorelli Marie at Sorelli Marie 63 at gmail.com. This is funny as shit. Queens guy says there's 103 people in here. Now, if everyone gave Tony $5, Tony might be able to eat, uh, get clams and duck and get his life back <laughs> on track. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens, guys, when. Uh, you know, he goes out, they give him money all day, and then he goes and eats $70 dinners and shit. Um, what was I going to say? Let me see. Oh, I got to do this real quick. Everybody, please hit the like button. And I am now, let me see, I think it's 14 subscribers away from 4,000. 
Uh, so, Come on, people. So, Come on, people. Yeah, so, Let's go. Get some subscriptions out there. Yeah, this if you're watching this. MBS. Thank you, Marie. If you're watching this and you're not subscribed, please subscribe. I'd appreciate it very much. And yeah. uh, if and you don't are subscribed. Don't forget about Shanna, too. Yes, definitely. Oh, of course. New beginnings with Shanna always. Uh, let me see. I'm going to pull this up. Watch. I'm, gonna, I'm surprised uh, Jimmy uh, hasn't jumped on. Yeah, I know. I don't know if he's watching or not. I talked to him a little while ago. He might be working. I don't know. He's uh, another good guy. He's yeah. I'm, I I, I want to meet him this coming Saturday. Days. Yeah. I, I you know told him I take him out for his birthday. Where's uh, he going Saturday? No, I I, I want to drive to Brooklyn to meet him. You know. Oh. And if you're coming in, Chris, you know, I mean, we can all meet together, you know? Yeah, that'd be nice. You know, because what, what I want to do is I want to do a – I mean, Marie's in Florida, but I want to do a live show from the Bergen Hunt and then drive over to the Ravenite and do it there and just talk about all those – that history by the Bergen Hunt and the Ravenite and that whole little small little area like we spoke about. There's so yeah. much history – in that yeah. little spot by Prince Street, by Ray's Pizza, by where old St. Patrick's Church is, and of course yep. in front of Ravenite and the Bergen Hunt. It, it's it's unbelievable. The, the, the yeah, Godfather is playing good. every day on Showtime. Yeah. Godfather is one, really? and he goes over to the Godfather two. Then the third one, they redid it. My wife's like, Why don't you stop watching it? I can't, you know, you, you got to watch at least 10 minutes of it. You have to. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, know, you can't refuse. Yeah. yeah. You know something, but every time you watch it, you always pick up something new. You always right. pick up something that you never seen. I, I watched it a million times. See, I, I always... watched just Al Pacino. I mean, he's definitely hot in that movie. He's, yeah. he's my kind of guy, Al Pacino. <laughs> he's definitely... Um, did you ever watch that guy's boat. podcast, Chris? Johnny Russo? <laughs> Did you ever watch his podcast? Oh. No, that I've guy heard interviews, is the biggest clown that I ever met. This guy lives on Mulberry Street, Marie. He was uh, Carlo from The Godfather. The, son the son-in-law? Uh-huh. His name is Johnny Russo. Okay. He's and the he's biggest Momo you have. He said he got kidnapped by Juan uh, Escobar. The Mexican club. Oh, Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar. Oh, oh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. he, uh, something happened. He got knocked on the head. He got brought to Brazil or Colombia, wherever he's from. And he was tortured in the basement. But for two days, they brought him upstairs. And instead of killing him, Pablo Escobar wanted him to redo the part uh, when he was getting. He says, if you do this part like you did it in The Godfather, I won't kill you. He told this on either Vlad TV or Patrick Bed David, this, this Momo. And he, he was like staring into the camera and swearing on his children that it was true. Somebody came to the United States to bop you on the head, put you in a plane, fly you to Brazil or Colombia to put you in a basement to torture you, to bring you upstairs in front of Pablo Escobar so you could uh, tell a part in a movie so you could save your, your life. Where are you getting this from? Isn't Pablo Escobar the guy that they had to build a prison <laughs> just for him? That's uh, Chacho that or Chavo. Yes. Chavo, okay. whatever. The one who had the motorcycle built. No, Escobar. Well, Escobar, I think he, he built his own prison. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. But you got you to gotta see wow. this guy's podcast. Yes. He said that he, that he slept with Marilyn Monroe, that he was Frank Costello's. He? Yeah, he said he was Frank Costello's... Uh, Goomba or a Paisan, whatever. Does he John A. Light? He Does said he uh, that he, uh, he sold John A. Light his shoes. Oh, you know? <laughs> and I dated him, too. Yeah, right? John, yeah, Russo's... I dated him. John A. Light wears his I think pants. Gianni... <laughs> he I lives... think Gianni Russo is like close to 80 years old. Yeah, he said he lives on Mulberry Street in one of the most expensive apartments. I don't even know if there's any expensive apartments down Mulberry Street. They're all abandoned buildings now with artwork in front of them. You know, you were here with me a couple months ago. Where is this stores. guy getting this from? I don't know. He said he's deaf in one ear. He had syphilis when he was a kid. 
That he almost oh, died. That, okay, that explains the craziness then. He had syphilis when he was a kid. His brain's got syphilis now. Unbelievable. Probably. He said that Malin, listen to that, Malin Monroe sent for him. He was at whatever hotel there was the, on 59th Street back in the day, the Hyatt or the Hilton, whatever, that he was such a great messenger boy. She sent for him. She locked the door, and he was up there for two days straight. Really? Really? Okay. There's so many bullshitters I, now. I, I don't even know what to say anymore. So many people I'm lying. Yeah. Malin Monroe. And then I after that, she kidding. flew him to Florida to meet the Kennedys. No, he didn't say oh. that, did he? Yeah, he said it on one of his podcasts. And he's telling the <laughs> story. And I'm I'm listening. I'm like, I was trying to get the number or something because it was a live uh, podcast. I was trying to get the number to call to get him on the phone and say, you Momo, you, you wait, there's something wrong with you. And the guy paid him, I think, $5,000. To do the interview, and it was like a three-part interview. He was oh talking God. about the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was talking about the Kennedys and Marilyn Monroe. Then he was talking about Elvis. Then he was talking about Frank Sinatra. How he taught Frank Sinatra how to swim. He taught Frank what? Sinatra how to swim. <laughs> I then he gave this guy. he gave him his first rubber ducky. Oh my God! I'm like, where, where did, where did they come from? They he made over 80 movies. Room. What's his name? John Gianni Russo. Oh my god. I mean, I yeah, he was in he was in the, the Godfather. Yeah, he, he was uh the, the son of law. I I'm not disputing that. Oh my god. Go look at man, yeah, don't get me knows. wrong. He's off like, his rocker. He, he's nuts. Let me yeah, read John, this here, Gianni Russo and Frank the Irishman. Sheeran must be brothers. That's the other uh, Momo that said that he killed Hoffa. Yeah, I know. Son of Hawaii, 499. Here's a little something to help get your merch going. Come on, guys. Let's do this. Thank you, Son of Hawaii. That's very nice of you. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah. Um, that Gianni Russo is a lunatic. Like I listened to him one day when I was at work like a few months back. And um, I, I, it was his Vlad interview, I think, what you're talking about. And the shit he said, he killed the, the who was it? He killed somebody who was oh, a child yeah. molester, like a fucking, like, he's, he's out of his mind, the shit he says. I think it was Michael Franchise was on, I forget what podcast, and they brought him up to him. And he just laughed. He says, look, I'm no comment. He goes, I'm him I'm, and A Light. They asked him about him and A Light. And yeah, he says, no comment. He goes, I I I know him. I met him once. He said he knew my father, but no comment. And on the other guy, he just skipped over the subject altogether. A -Light. Does he know where Jimmy Hoff is buried? That's what I want to know. Supposedly, Michael Frenchies has a tape of a guy that he did time with that knows exactly where his body is, and it's Supposedly down where the Titanic is. I'm saying in the water. I that's heard it was where a giant stadium. Well, that was one thing, but they say that he was buried at sea. And they'll never find his remains. Yeah. And, that, so and that's that's coming dishes. from Michael Frenchies. I think there's some truth to the matter because okay. he was approached by the government and he doesn't want to turn. He says eventually he has to turn those tapes over. <sighs> Because the person that is saying this was one of the last people that was with Hoffa at the diner in Michigan when he disappeared. So there is truth to the matter. But he doesn't want to give up those tapes. But he's going to have to eventually. Because the family yeah. wants to know what happened to the father. Yeah, I mean, it's what the son, the son now runs the union. Jimmy yeah. Hoffa Jr. Mm -hmm. He's in that. Yeah, wow. he does. Yeah. Um, wow. Daddy had his autograph. On a napkin. He was oh, a really? union guy. I mean, my I, father I was, was my father was a, my father was a teamster, local seven oh seven. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he went to a rally in Jersey, and he look he was a good man. He put everybody to work. He sh he should have kept his mouth shut later on when he came out of jail, but he put everybody to work, and he would just sign matchbook covers, cocktail napkins, this and that, and he signed. A napkin that my father, I guess, had a drink on, whatever, and my father kept it. 
and he just had it. And I couldn't even barely see it, but it, it said J.R. Hoffa, because his middle name was Riddle, this and that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened to it. And he also had a, birth, a birthday card or a New Year's Eve card from Gotti from Marion Prison. And I don't know what my wife did when we when we were going through his stuff, when he went to the nursing home, and that disappeared. Yeah, you don't want to lose something like that. Disappeared. The guy who took over the apartment, I said, Georgie, where is the card that he sent my father from prison? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I seen it, but I, I really? I could have put it on porn stars. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Yeah, for sure. Um, I could have been an A-Light selling uh, with ball bats. Bats. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but Tim Jimmy Hoffa's autograph on it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Does anybody have any questions for the Sorellis? Because we're going to get going in a minute here. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Pacino A. Hoffa. Well, what does it say? It says Pacino Ace Hoffa. Oh, Pounding playing them. that pink veal. Pounding that pink veal. I love the name. Good evening, Carol. Carol Mahal is with us. The real story will never come out. I believe that too. Yeah, we'll never know. Mm -hmm. um, Does anybody want me to put the shirt back up one last time, or has everybody got a good look at it? Go ahead. Why not? Oh. The Sorelli's got their merch before I have mine. There you go. And give your email again for that, Marie. Sorelli Marie sixty three at gmail dot com. There you go. All right. All right. Hopefully, you guys get some emails about those shirts. That would be great. I'd Absolutely. be happy. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, um, it is a very awesome shirt, Lexi. Yes, it is. Yankees we love for life. Monday nights with you guys. Yeah. Yankees for life. Cal, how how are you doing tonight? What happened to Grandpa Walton? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I haven't seen. When was the last time that show was on? 1979. We used to watch that show that, that, religiously. That was yeah. a good show. Da, 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 da. Yeah. I know. I remember the song. Good night, John Boy. Good night. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Good night, Mary Ellen. <laughs> used to make night, me always Mary. in the mood to have uh, pancakes. Yeah, exactly. I always wanted that that the grandma to be our grandma. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because she was just so sweet and lovable. Look, yeah, yep, yeah, there he is. There's Lee Cole there's John there. Light, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. John A. Light to the right of him. And the girl that's in his yeah. arms is not his niece; it's his brother's daughter. <laughs> Marie, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> Did you hear that today, Jimmy? Uh, I didn't, didn't see know, it. Lee didn't it know that his brother's daughter was his niece. He kept saying, Josie said, uh, Dudes Jules is my niece. That's not my niece. It's my brother's daughter. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus Christ. What is he so sniffing? I wrote, was glue? I wrote that uh, he's his own no, grandpa no. then, too. Yeah. Yep. It's hilarious. Let's put him up again. Yep. Good night, That's Jim Bob. His daughter. That is not his niece. That's his brother's daughter. Brother's daughter. That's right. So, what was uh, Grandpa Walton's name? Uh, Grandpa. Grandpa? <laughs> huh? I don't know what is his what his real name. And no, no, no. What was I'm, his name in the show? Did they just the show? Call him Grandpa? Yeah, Grandpa. Grandpa. Yeah. All right. So there's, there's there was, a new name. There was Grandpa. Me, Grandpa John Boy, Joe Bob, Mary Ellen, Jim Bob, Bob, Mary Bob. Ellen. I, I Those sounds. The like, they, they sound like names that should belong in Lee's family. Um, exactly. There you go. Here's another name for Lee then, Grandpa Walton. There you go. Simple as At that. least Grandpa Walton had teeth. Marie, yeah, did you sure. see the show they did with the with, with Deliverance? They put his face on. Remember the, the movie Deliverance with Burt Reynolds and Yeah, uh, yeah, where they chased the pig around and they sing what dueling banjos. Yeah, they, yeah. they, they put Whatever. Lee Cole's face on that actor no. that died recently. Yeah. Ned Beatty. No way. Yeah, really? When he was getting violated in the woods? Yeah, getting violated in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Steph, I, I, I couldn't. I, 
You got to wow. you got to see it. You got to see it. I got to say that. Yeah. Yeah, wow. uh, that well, he deserves hilarious. it. Maybe he should get it in real life. He Johnny it. the Greek from London FBS X the Sorelli's. Will they send the T-shirt to England if I ordered one, please? I don't see why not. If you pay uh, the shipping and handling, why not? Yeah. I just sent something for Shanna. Shanna sells her little pens and pads and stuff, and I sent it to uh, Northern Ireland to somebody, and it was fucking twenty six dollars okay. to send it. So. I'll tell you a funny story about England. Our father was stationed in England when he was in the army during the Korean War. My father, he didn't see combat, but he fell in love with a person, this girl in England, and he was going to get married. And the chaplain called my grandmother. My grandmother wouldn't have no part of it. And she got involved and he came. He was going to stay in England and he was going to get married. So we would be in England right now having this podcast sipping tea. yeah and you know i'd have the the derby on sipping tea and listen to the Maybe beatles doing this yeah good good day mate <laughs> doing the queen's way no, that's australian good day mate oh whatever fish do. tea there uh, yeah edward Eat. it's a sport of tea yeah eating fish and chips. the sport of tea so if we send him a shirt let, see if you can look up our maybe our stepmother I fucking love or, the Sorelli. What would have been our stepmother? Mother would have stepped. She's probably dead by now. <laughs> oh my god! Maybe not. Maybe she's uh, part of the royal family. <laughs> I enjoyed this show tonight. It was very good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this was great, guys. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this knowledge about the the Feos and the Amityville Horror. This was great. Um, I would stay on longer, but I'm exhausted, no, no. and I have to. Uh, I have to figure out what I'm doing. I'm I might even do something crazy. I got more videos to look at tomorrow. Just to get the rest of my subs. Um yeah, yeah. Well, you never run out. No, you um, wouldn't be you, Jimmy. Whatever that means. Looking for the truth. Yankees no, you for life. The Sorellis are really good people. Thank you. You guys are all great people. Each and every one of you are just wonderful. And we enjoy spending spending Monday nights with you guys. Yeah. I was You're hoping really Jimmy uh I was hoping Jimmy C would jump on, but yeah, I don't know if he's uh like I said, he might be at work. He works nights a lot. So I I talked to him a couple hours ago, but I don't know what he's up to. If, I, if he was watching, I'm assuming he'd be in the chat, but oh yeah. Yeah. Um I know he was uh, on Johnny earlier. S Johnny says, of course I will pay for the post and packaging. So there you go. But the next uh, next so time, yeah. do you know when he's coming back on again, Chris? Jimmy? Who, Jimmy? Yeah. I don't know. Jimmy does it randomly. Like, Jimmy's funny. I'll, I'll tell him, hey, you should do a video today. And he'll say, uh, maybe over the weekend or in a few days. And then six minutes later, he'll pop on. So I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I never know when Jimmy's going to do a video. I have no idea. What about uh, uh, Gunsmoke? Is he on? Um, I don't know what's up with Gunsmoke. I, I think he was in here earlier, but I haven't heard from him in a couple of days. Yeah, I don't think I was ever introduced to him. I, uh, I've... I've seen him, but uh, never got the chance. John Smith's a good guy. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, he's a really good guy. And I want to give a shout out to Jerry, the art guy, for that little intro he played. Did you guys see this? Check this out. Tell me what you think. This is one of the one of the many new intros. Um, uh, Jerry, the art guy, made me take a look at this. <laughs> Nice. I like awesome? it. I like it. He has all that the uh, awesome. all the all the people I've interviewed and all my guests and stuff behind me moving. I'm sure you guys are in there somewhere. Um, and he's got me as the Godfather, uh, Jerry the Art you Guy. You look just anybody... like him. I mean, you look just like him. <laughs> yeah, apparently, I don't think he had to do much to that picture. No, you um, look just like him. Yeah. If anybody wants to contact Jerry the Art Guy, MovieRama777 at gmail.com. Uh, he just did one for Josie. He did Jimmy's. He did uh, all of Shanna's artwork for her page, Brooklyn Guys. Nice. Uh, the dude's incredible. So, all right, guys. Thank you so much uh, for being thank you, here. Chris. Yeah. Well, of course, thank we'll do guys. it again in, in a couple of weeks or something, as yeah. usual. Um, uh, and gotta, I got to find, got. find something else to. Uh, to have the subject on. Yeah, let me know what else you guys got. If not, you could just come on and hang out with me and we could just talk to people in the chat and stuff. 
um, we we'll find Italian something. Thanksgiving, you know, we don't have turkey. We have lasagna. You never know. No, no. We, we might it's have landed on the Plymouth Rock. You don't know. There might have been a Sorelli That's that landed on the Plymouth Rock <laughs> and Absolutely. broke bread with one of the Indians. You never know. Absolutely. You they never didn't know. Stay, yeah. They're the ones that gave him the beach to sell to the Indians. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or we, we might Italian. be related to Christopher Columbus. It could be. Yeah. It's so funny you, you said go. that. Marie, it's so funny you said that about lasagna on Thanksgiving. That's the way my family's always been. It's either baked ziti, lasagna, something like that, stuffed shell. You know what I mean? Like, yep. it's never. Yep. Uh, it, it's not it's, about it's, the it's, turkey. It's about the lasagna. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I like it the next day with, with uh, lettuce, uh, bacon, and mayo. Turkey. Lasagna? No, turkey. <laughs> okay. You got and it, brother. Big, and the big steak fries. Oh, yeah, I know. Those are your favorite. And pizza. Don't forget about the pizza. I had pizza tonight. Oh, Again. Of course you did. Again. And you're going to oh, have Mr. Wonderful ate the, the, the macaroni. Uh, like he eats uh, everything. All right. Well, love you guys. Thanks for spending the love night. Love you too, Miss. Appreciate you and love you safe. guys. All right, you I'm gonna too. stay on for a few guys. minutes after. I'm gonna stay on for a few minutes after you got off. You get off, but thank you very much for coming on, guys. I'll talk to you soon, and then we'll do this again in a couple of weeks. Right. You got it. Look Ciao, everybody. To everybody. Maria, yeah. I'll talk to you Wonderful tomorrow. Day. Salute. Yep. Ciao. See you guys. Bye. All right. Another great show with the Sorellis. I love those two. They crack me up. Um, and they got a lot of good knowledge. And like I said, a lot of mob ties to their families. They got a lot of stories to tell. Theresa Murphy, 1999 Super Sticker. Thank you very much. That uh, means a lot to me. I appreciate that from you. You're awesome for that. Um, uh, Lexi says, bye, Sorellis. Another great show, FBS. Thank you. Love the way you Italians eat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're known for it. Tony Pizza is getting gay married. So happy for him. That's funny. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at some other comments. Listen, guys, if you're not subscribed, do me a favor. Please hit the hit, blah, 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 blah. please hit the like button and go subscribe because I'm still 14 away. I would love to hit that number tonight or overnight. It would be excellent. So anybody who's not subscribed, please go subscribe. We'll have more good content like this for you. Some other stuff too. I do different types of things, as you all know. So uh I can't wait to hit the four G's. Once I do that, uh, I'm going to be a very happy guy. And I'm so close as we speak. So I've been crawling, but I'm getting there. So, yeah. And for the love of God, hit the notification bell if you are already subscribed. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I forgot that. You could tell I'm getting tired. I might fuck around and come back on later just to have a, a marathon. Let's get to the 4,000 mark show. I should. Um, I should, I don't know if I can, I'm exhausted, but I should do that. Need to buy Tony Pizza a new bottle of piss, or a new bottle to piss in because he's got a window to throw it out of. <laughs> uh, 4,000 subs, we almost there, FBS, yeah. We're so close. To fail, lost respect after all that, and eventually was pushed out in his old age by Barney and Shin. I'm still shocked that Tony uh, Kelso Pizza gets about 90 people to hang on to his show the entire way. Like I said, you can't take your eyes off a train wreck. Marathon run to 4,000 subs. Uh, 4,000 inevitable. Yeah, I would like to do it. I'm just tired, and I got to get to bed kind of early. But I should end this show and come back on at some point and just see if we can pull it off tonight. That would be good. Maybe I will. I don't know. But... Either way, thank you guys for everything. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Thank you to the Sorellis. You guys are uh, awesome as always. And they gave us some great content tonight. And this was the easiest show I ever did. Uh, I was listening to them just like you guys were listening to them. It was really fantastic. 
Don't oversleep FBS. I bet you'll have it in the AM. Hopefully. But this thing is weird. Like, I'll go up, 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 and then I'll lose, like, 15. And then I have to go back up again, like, out of nowhere. Or I'll gain a bunch, and then uh, I don't know exactly how this works or why it works the way it does, but I'm at 3,986 now. So call your friends and tell them to subscribe to Fat Ball Sicilian. You guys can pull it off. Uh, if not, might take me till tomorrow, maybe even the next day. But I'll get there eventually, and we'll have a nice big celebration show. So thank you guys for everything. You know that uh, all of you, you know, your support, it means the world to me. And, uh, you know, just having you guys in here every time I click that live button, definitely, uh, you know, helps me out every day and, and helps to, uh, to make me a happier person. It's a very important part of my life, and uh, I love being able to do this and knowing that you guys will always be here whenever I decide to come on. So thanks again. I appreciate you all very much. I love you. Don't forget, call your friends. Tell them to subscribe tonight, and we can get to that 4Gs. And as soon as we do, I'll do a nice celebration show. All right? Until next time, guys, I love you all. So.